booth over there and just preach your heart out. Brother Denny, preach for us. Now we're ready to go. Since I've been a member of this church, uh, I have come to love you as my friends and my church family and as brothers and sisters in Christ, so that will help me get through this. I'm sure if there's any criticism, that it'd be constructive criticism, So, uh, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. During this short time uh, that I'm up here to speak, uh, the first and foremost thing is I want to bring honor and glory to God uh, by the words that I say. And uh, hopefully I'll just say something that will stick in your heart and maybe you can take it home with you and maybe it will just draw you a little bit closer to God. So aren't you glad you're here? Aren't you glad that you, uh, that you just didn't have to have your arm twisted and uh, somebody had to drag you into church to get you here? But now that you're here, what do you do with all that time while you're here? Well, I dare say that uh, uh, some people go to church for the wrong reasons. Uh, some scenarios maybe, well... <laughs> I'm an important man. I'm a big businessman in this town. What are people going to think if I don't go to church? I've got to look good in the community. Or maybe it's a husband and wife. Now, honey, I've got to go to church today. I've just got to be there. Mr. Jones is going to be there, and he's the biggest contractor in town. You know what his business is going to mean for our family. Maybe it's a girlfriend and a boyfriend. Dad, I need for you to run me to church today. Well, Jack, why do you want to go to church today? You don't usually go. Well, Dad, Jill's going to be there today. And she is so pretty. And I just want to go to church so I can see her. Or Jill, Mom, I need for you to take me to church this morning. Jill, you usually don't go to church. Why do you want to go to church today? Well, because Jack's going to be there and he's just so cute. Well, obviously these aren't good reasons for us to go to church. They're not necessarily 100% wrong. Maybe a, maybe a businessman who goes to church because he goes to church and he's exposed to the Word of God. He hears the gospel. Maybe he'll become saved. Uh, maybe a girlfriend or a boyfriend will lead the other one to Christ because they've taken them to church. Quite possibly a husband could uh, get his wife to go to church with him and she might get saved. Or possibly a wife could get a husband to go to church with her and he might get saved. But what are the reasons uh, that we should go to church? Why should we go to church? We go to church, number one, we want to praise God. We praise God as the creator of this universe, the creator of all of us. Uh, We praise Jesus Christ because he's our Savior. He's the King of kings and the Lord of lords. We come to church to pray. Maybe you just have a prayer that's been unanswered. Maybe you have a sin in your life that you need to confess to God. Uh, possibly you have a burden on your heart for a friend or, or a, a family member. And sometimes the only thing that's ever going to take care of that is just taking it to the altar and kneeling down and praying and leaving it with God. Uh, we come to church to give thanks. We give thanks to God. We give thanks to Jesus Christ because of what he did for us on Calvary's cross. He laid down his life and shed his innocent blood on Calvary's cross for us. We give thanks to God for his grace and for his mercy. For his, for his grace because he gives us what we don't deserve. And for his mercy because he does not give us what we do deserve. And that's hell. We know that the focus anytime, anytime we're in church We know that the focus is always on God and Jesus Christ. That's why we're here. But what's the actual church service, the actual church service centered around? Centered around the preaching of the Word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16 and 2 Timothy 4, verse uh, 1 and 2 says, out of the King James Bible, 
All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. You know, God expects us to be reverent to his word. We're reverent when we come into the church house. You know, you don't come in with your hat on. You don't come in and yell and scream and run in the church. We want to be reverent when we're in God's church. But we also want to be reverent to God's word. Uh, I think sometimes uh, we come to church and we get lazy in our hearing. We start out really good. We come to church and, and, you know, the church is filled with the Spirit. We sing songs of praise. We give our tithes and offerings. We pray. And then the preacher gets up and starts to preach. And somewhere during that 45 minutes to an hour that the preacher's preaching, we've all done it before, every single one of us. We've drifted off. We've started thinking about that fried chicken, biscuits, and gravy we're going to have for lunch. That's my big problem. Or, or perhaps we're thinking about, man, the time is really getting short, and he's long-winded today. If he doesn't hurry up, I'm going to miss the second half of the ball game. So hurry. Uh, you know, Satan's going to use any tactic that he can, any tactic that he possibly can, he'll use to distract you and draw you away from the Word of God. He's going to do it if he gets an opportunity to. Now, chances are that that five or ten minutes that you were absent during that service, that five or ten minutes while you were at the ball game or you were eating lunch, God had the answer to the question that you've been asking or he had the solution for the problem that you now face. You know, we should come to church consciously expecting to hear a word from God. Luke chapter 8, verse 18 says, Take heed therefore how ye hear, for whosoever hath to him shall be given, and whosoever hath not from him shall be taken, even that which he seemeth to have. This uh, obviously says take heed how ye hear. It doesn't say take heed what you hear. Now, we should be careful what we hear. You know, we don't want to listen to nasty jokes. We don't want to listen to inappropriate music. There's a lot of things that we should not hear. Uh, but this verse didn't say uh, what you hear. This verse said, take heed, therefore, how you hear. This verse comes with a warning, and it comes with a blessing, and it comes with a warning. The blessing in this verse is that if we come to church consciously, listening with earnest, paying attention to God's word, that we have a foundation for him to be able to bless us with more knowledge and ability to do his work. If we come to church and we listen negligently, if we don't hear what God's got to say to us, if we're careless or haphazard, or we really don't care whether we hear it or not, that which we even seem to have will just gradually fade away and we'll lose it. You know, I, I want to start my new year uh, with a new attitude. I know that God has a, like I said before, God has an answer to every question I've got. God has the solution for every problem that I face. If I'll just not listen, but I'll hear what God's got to say to me. Bible.org says that the word here is listed in the Bible some 347 times. I feel like if it's important enough for God to put it in the Bible 347 times, it's important for me to take heed how I hear it. Thank you. Well, I feel like giving an invitation now. Man. Really, that, that's a good message. Excellent message. He packed a lot of stuff in. When you're preparing for a five, ten minute message, it, every minute counts. Uh, by the way, I, I just want to put you guys at ease. Uh, this is being live streamed, isn't it? All over the world, and so I just wanted you to relax. Uh, <laughs> uh, the only way you can hide from the camera is if you go all the way over uh, to the piano. You'll, you'll hide from the camera, but if you stay out in the middle, it's going to pick you up. Uh, all right, Brother Matt, he's getting geared up and ready to go. He's uh, at Pensacola, Florida, and 
he had to come up here to get some good preaching, and so that's why we're having him, <laughs> having him do the preaching. <laughs> Go ahead. Galatians 5, chapter, uh, Galatians 5, verse 2. Really popular portion of scripture. I'm sure many of you heard sermons out of this before. Um, that is the wrong verse. what I'm looking for is the, um, it talks about the fruit of the Spirit, and it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, and faith, and um, right behind love is joy, and joy is really important in the Christian life. Um, I think God clearly shows that it's important by putting it second right there in that verse. Um, in Philippians 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. If you're saved, one of the greatest gifts that God has given to us as Christians is joy in Him. And the joy that we, be, that we have in Christ, we should be thro showing to others. And if we're not showing that joy that we have to other people, then somehow it's getting blocked. And um, I personally don't want to be the reason why that gets blocked. Um, if you're taking notes or anything like that, a definition for joy that uh, I have is the realization that God is in control. So when we realize that God is in control in our lives, um, then we will have true joy in our life. Um, my two main points, um, there's things that will block our joy, things that will bust our joy up, and then the things that will build our joy up. The first joy buster is unsatisfied expectations. Um, if you'll turn to Philippians 4, verse 12, it says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Um, Paul suffered many things in life, and he knew how to be content with the things that he had, the things that he didn't have. Um, you'll never be able to know true joy in your life until you learn to be content. Uh, if you're always looking for the next thing, um, looking for bigger and better things, um, you'll never be satisfied, uh, no matter how much wealth you get. That's why rich people, um, they're never satisfied, and many times they commit suicide, and people wonder why they're unhappy, and poor people are usually more happy. It's because they're always constantly looking for what's next. Um, contentment will not come to you when you have everything you want, but when you have, but when you want everything that you have. Number two, uh, under joy busters, is unresolved conflict. Um, Philippians two verse two says, "Fulfill ye my joy, that ye may be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind." Here in our church, um, we all need to be of one accord and of one mind. Um, right. And when there's unresolved conflict between Christians and between brothers in Christ, that won't bring joy to God, that won't bring joy in your life. Uh, number three, unrepented sin. Um, Psalm 32, verse 1, if you'll turn there. <clears throat> It says, Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputed not in iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned unto the drought of summer, Selah. I acknowledge my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. 
I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. See law. One of the things that will steal your joy quicker than anything is guilt. If you're constantly looking back, uh, wondering, did I do this wrong? Did I... Um, am I in... Am I serving God the way I should by um, just not doing the things that I should be doing? Um, you won't be, be able to use by him by always constantly having guilt in your life. So now that we know what will bust our joy, um, let's look at what will build our joy. Uh, number one, uh, surrender to God. If you turn to John chapter 15, verse number 10, it says, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Just as a contrast to the unrepented sin point, um, if we confess our sins and we obey his commandments, he promises right here that he'll give us, that he'll abide, that we'll abide in his love, and that he wants to give us his joy. Number two, serve others. When we focus on helping others, we get our eyes off our own situation. Um, in this new year, there's plenty of opportunities to get involved. And one of the things that will bring you joy in your life more than anything is helping others. Um, not looking at your own circumstances, but looking to see what you can do for others and helping them. Number three, and my last point, give your circumstances over to God. Proverbs 3, verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not unto thine own understanding. If we trust the Lord and not constantly worry about what's going to happen next, um, then we'll be able to see what God can do in our life and we will have the joy that he wants us to have. So in conclusion, don't let your joy get busted in 2015. Live your life and surrender to God. Look to serve others and trust God and let him have control of your circumstances. Well, praise the Lord. I, I read today that... Uh, famous athlete who is now past his prime the article said he's having trouble finding fulfillment outside of the sport that he participated in for so many years and then it said it's because he didn't find fulfillment in the sport either because fulfillment is in neither place it's in Christ and so people can spend their life, that's good, Brother Matt, people can spend their life chasing joy and contentment and fulfillment. And if they're looking for it outside of Christ, it's a vanishing rainbow. It's a mirage. It ain't going to happen. He created us to love him and to find our fulfillment in him. Good job. Well, let's have the ushers come. We'll receive the uh, missions offering tonight. And uh, <coughs> then... We're going to have Brother uh, Marcus ready, geared up and ready to go right after the uh, offering. So come ahead, fellas. And uh, <clears throat> yellow, we've got the yellow mic on here. There you go. Brother Paul, will you pray? Lord God, it's always, an, always a joy and a love to give. We have the missions. It can be said that uh, the missions that we support here at Liberty Baptist Church, the sun never sets. Lord, they only are successful because of little churches like us that continue to provide them monthly, weekly, daily support. And Lord, you have indeed blessed us this year, and through this church, you have blessed these missionaries. Yes. And Lord, we pray that we'll be able to be, do an even better job of blessing them in the year to come. In our name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, as a pastor, it's my joy to have, uh, have men just like these who are preaching tonight. Brother, uh, Brother Denny has really blossomed here. You've blossomed in this church, Brother. I appreciate you so much. And, and Brother Matt uh, pretty much grew up here and went off to Bible college, and he's finished with that now and going on with life, and that's a pleasure. And then Brother Marcus, come ahead, Brother Marcus. He was called to preach in this church, and, uh, and he's getting geared up to serve the Lord with a whole long lifetime, we hope. God for the opportunity to preach again. Uh, Brother Denny, I have a question for you. Who is this a picture of? That's, that's a good answer. That's a good answer. Okay, uh, the title of my sermon tonight is What Does Jesus Look Like? Um, if you have your Bible with you, please turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Corinthians 11. Everyone there? Okay. I'm going to start. I'm going to read verses uh, 14 and 15. Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man have long hair, it is a shame unto him? But if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Um, the world, they want us to think that this is what Jesus looks like. Now, to me, it doesn't make a lot of sense for Jesus to have long hair, and then Paul turned right around and said, "It's a shame for a man to have long hair." I, um, you know, all things in the world, we need to, you know, we need to use this book to judge them. Uh, we don't need to get these false images in our head. Um, so, what, what we can learn from this is that uh, Jesus had short hair. We don't know exactly what Jesus did look like, but the Scripture does give us some things that he did not look like. Uh, number one, we know that he had short hair. Um, if you will turn over to Isaiah chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, I'm going to start reading verse 1, and I'll probably read the first three verses. Um, this prophecy here is a prophecy about the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah is writing here. He says, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. I want to focus in, focus in on verse 2. It says, He hath no form, no comeliness. The word comeliness, it means like attractive or good. Um, the Bible is teaching here Jesus, when he was in the flesh, there was, he was not physically attractive. Um, he said there was no beauty that we should desire him. Now, I'm not a woman. I can't tell you if this is a physically attractive man, but... I <laughs> But uh, the scripture, <laughs> scripture does teach that Jesus, he was not physically attractive in the flesh. There was no beauty that we should desire him. So uh, the second thing we can learn here is that he wasn't physically attractive. First thing we learned was he had short hair. Um, if you will, flip over a little bit more in the Old Testament to Deuteronomy chapter 5. Deuteronomy chapter 5. Jump in the Ten Commandments here. Deuteronomy chapter 5, I'm going to read verse 8. Thou shalt not make thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters beneath the earth. <laughs> this verse here teaches us that um, we shouldn't make any graven images of nothing that is in heaven, uh, no likeness of anything that is in heaven. I, um, we know that Jesus doesn't look like this, but we, we shouldn't try to make any image of what we think Jesus might look like. Um, I, God purposely, he didn't give us a picture like this of what Jesus looks like. Um, I, I think for a couple of different reasons, but um, 
uh, w whenever we uh, try to make images of uh, Jesus or God or angels or anything like that, that that's idolatry. We shouldn't have uh, no so-called Jesus statues. And I believe this verse even covers here like the little statues of angels. It says that, uh, or any in likeness of anything that is in heaven above. Um, angels there in heaven. I don't believe that we should have even the little angel statues either, especially not the so-called Jesus statues. And the majority of the ones that you see, they all have long hair, you know, some physically attractive man. And using scripture, we know that he didn't look like that. Um, so if you have those Jesus statues, you need to get rid of them. It's not biblical. It's idolatry. Um, um, and I don't have any scripture on this. This is just my personal thoughts. Um, me personally, I think the Antichrist will look something like this. I think there's a reason that the devil props this up to make people believe this is what Jesus is going to look like. I think that's another reason why so many people will flock to him. But like I said, that's just me. I don't have any scripture on that. It's just my personal thoughts. Um, uh, the title of my sermon is, What Does Jesus Look Like? Um, to answer the question, uh, Jesus looks like, he looks like Genesis through Revelation. If you want a picture of Jesus, just read this book here. Um, What's the saying? Uh, that said, picture is worth a thousand words. I'm going to start a new saying tonight. And I want you all to write me down for this, okay? That said, a picture is worth a thousand words. Okay, I say, these thousands of words paint the picture of Jesus Christ. So if you want to know what Jesus looks like, read Genesis through Revelation. All right, that's all I have prepared tonight. Thanks, Brother Marcus. I feel better now since, uh, since he pointed out in the scripture that Jesus had no comeliness wasn't very attractive I feel more godly now <laughs> Amen. all right we've got uh, what we got we got uh, we've got a hymn coming up and then uh, brother Paul will be the next speaker so brother Aaron's gonna sing us a hymn sing with us a hymn let's stand together if you're able and give you a chance to stretch just a little bit and let's sing number 50 number 50 there's power in the blood We'll sing the first and last verses. Would you be free from the burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb on the last. Would you do service for Jesus your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you live daily His praises to sing? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. And be seated. Uh, Brother Paul, come ahead. Brother Paul has uh, been here longer than, he and his family have been here longer than anybody else in the church now. Uh, with the exception of my own family. And so Brother Paul, has he's really flourished as a speaker. He's been teaching an adult Sunday school class now for a long time, and, and he's, uh, he's doing a great job. Come ahead and preach for us, brother. Thank you for those kind words, Pastor. Um, we're going to be in 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're going to do two verses, verses 6 and 7 tonight. I get ready to read this. This is uh, Paul's last testament. And I suspect that the only thing that I really have in comparison to Paul's last testament is I share the same name as Paul. But just like we are to become Christ-like, I think the Apostle Paul also serves as an example of how each of us should strive to attain in service to God. And if we use the Apostle Paul, and I, I don't want to go through all the many things that the Apostle Paul went through, but I want to use his life as a, as a way to model my life after, particularly as I share with you, I'm going to share with you a little bit of my testimony tonight and where God has taken me and where I have come from to be able finally, hopefully, to be of use. 
pastor often talks about that he wants to finish strong. You know, our pastor will probably never retire. I suspect he will die in the pulpit because he believes that the calling that God has placed upon his heart is an eternal calling as far as this world is. And so we all have that opportunity. We all have that obligation, perhaps not as a pastor, but certainly as a member of Liberty Baptist Church. And as our family gets ready to leave, many of you are stepping up to do some of the things that Dee and I used to do. Plus, you're going to be doing probably things at a much better level than we've ever done them. And you're doing it out of a sense of joy, as Matthew talked about. You know, joy makes all the difference. I mean, whether you're carrying mail or in working for the Air Force, I can't imagine feeling joyful or working for the Army, but if you, if you ever were actually in that situation, it does make a difference to be joyful in your service. And as Brother Denny mentioned a little bit earlier today, you know, I talked about the, you know, that the second half is coming up. We've got to get home for the game. Nobody really cares about Mississippi State, Georgia Tech, right? Nobody cares about that game. All right, so we don't have to worry about that. And, uh, and I'm here to tell you that I wholeheartedly support what uh, the Brother Marcus preached on tonight. Since I no longer have the ability to grow hair, I believe that Jesus did have short hair. And, and so as we look forward to and as we look forward to what Brother Aaron has to say tonight, I just want to take an opportunity to, to share a little bit with you about this last testament of Apostle Paul. In verse 6 it says, For now I'm ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I started out my Christian life basically having almost perfect attendance in the base chapel in the Methodist church in which I was brought up in. And the reality, what happened to the clock? Huh? Okay. <laughs> and so... Uh, <laughs> and so... <laughs> At least he didn't restart it to one minute. But, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so, and, uh, so I started that, and, um, but there was a small problem with the way I was worshiping God. I wasn't saved. I was simply going through the motions of attending church. Sometimes I would read my Bible. Sometimes I would, um, I might serve God a little bit and do something you know, nice for somebody. But in that type of a church, it was a works-based experience versus one that recognizes that it should be grace and mercy and for what God did for us and what we're not, quote, doing for God. Now, clearly, after we're saved, we are doing things for God. But we don't do things to get saved. We don't do things to be kept saved. And it really isn't really up to us. All we simply have to do is, is go through that very deep philosophical and theological battle by simply using the word, saying the word yes. And yet, how hard is that to do? How many times did it take you, how many times did you say no before you said yes? Oftentimes, it is the environment that you are, we are raised up in. Um, being raised again in that type of a church, we never had an altar call. You know, come forward and, you know, and give your life to God or anything like that. There was never anything like that. There really wasn't, you know, I went through a process called confirmation and in so doing I was a member of the church. Now if some of this sounds familiar to some of you, you know, it's, it's what a lot of people are dealing with. But there, it was never really touched upon my salvation. It just sort of touched upon my membership. And so when I finally got saved, in a church where they were doing something I'd never even been experienced before to. They were, they were doing this, this thing about preaching verse by verse through the Bible. What a concept. Now, our pastor tends to do that all the time, preaching verse by verse. And also, they had something called an altar call. And also, I had two men come to, my, come to see me one night, and they asked me the strangest question. I mean, I've been in church all my life. But they asked me the question, did I know for sure that I would be going to heaven if I died tonight? I mean, I've been raised in church all my life. But I'd never had anybody come to my door and ask me that. How many, how many people that go to church in various denominations all around the city, 
how many of them have actually never had somebody ask them about their faith? Ask them if they'd ever been saved. And so a lot of times we a lot of times the confusion that we have in responding to a gospel presentation of, and the importance of accept of saying yes to the blood of Jesus Christ is what we were raised up in. I was saved when I was 26. How long did it take me before I got baptized? Well, you, normally you get baptized, what do you think, Larry? Normally a couple days after you get, you get saved, you get baptized, right? It took me a little over a year. Oh, how, how could that have happened? Because you have to undo all the religious learning I had had before. Because after all, I'd been baptized as an infant, so there really was no need for me to be re-baptized. And this is what we get into. This is what we start struggling with, is when we come to believe a certain thing, and even though God's word says that what we believe is not right, there's something called pride that gets in the way. And oftentimes, we don't want to acknowledge that what we had learned about God, learned about Jesus, learned about the church in the past, was not valid. And we have to give that up. And yet, I mean, it's just like, <laughs> I had a, when I was dating my wife, and we talked a little bit about, you know, about Baptists and Protestants, and she declared to me that she wasn't even a Protestant. And I said, well, how dare you? How, you came out of the Reformation. And she said, no, I didn't come out of the Reformation. I came out of an unbroken string of Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches that were established by the disciples and had been maintained throughout history. How many people know that? Do they really know it? And so my first 26 years, and then when I got saved, baptized when I was 28, was basically lost years. Now then, then the next 30 years, bringing me up to tonight, was a process as I was as we were moved in the military. Not only was I getting promoted and getting more and more responsibility, but the but the real journey was I was coming into more and more of a Bible believing, Bible preaching church along the way. We started off in liberal Southern Baptist. I mean, where does a Methodist and a and a uh, ABA go to? Where where do they go to church, Miss Karen? Where does a Methodist and an and a ABA girl go to? We started off in Southern Baptist Church. Turned out it was a liberal Southern Baptist Church. But as we moved on our assignments, we got closer and closer to Bible-believing, Bible-preaching churches to where we reached a point along the way as we continued to be taught, as we continued to read our Bible, as I continued to discover more of my Bible, came to believe, and I had to change a lot of what I used to believe. And there's really nothing wrong with that, is there? As long as what you change from what you believed before to what is now truth. And this is what I have come to believe. And I have seen that same sort of transformation come among several of you out here, like Brother Denny was talking tonight, what the process that he has gone through and the confidence he now has in being able to stand up and give a presentation of the Word of God. All of us should be able to do that, whether we're women, teenagers, you know, <laughs> all of us should be able to do that. Well, how could I ever witness? I mean, that, that's just too hard, isn't it? No, simply state how your life was before you got saved and how it has changed afterwards. Simple to say, hard to do. By the time we got to Japan, under Brother Nutt, who you've met several times now, who's had an opportunity to come through here, we got to the point where we got called to the mission field. Now, that just doesn't happen overnight, does it, Brother Denny? God has to work on us through the process. And now that we've been here, are you okay, Miss Kaylin? You're not fading away, are you? But as we, uh, as we get through here, pastor has made a difference. In fact, we have probably quite possibly lived here longer than any other place I've ever lived. Being in a military family has probably been right here in Arkansas. Because of the influence of pastor has further prepared our hearts for what we believe God has. So we believe that the time has come for us to move into another, into a new direction. And whereas it's going to be hard to leave our family 
and you're our family, you know, you are our family behind, we know that we have the support and the love of you all behind us as we go off. And who knows what we're going to do in this last, however time God gives us, last 5, 10, 15, 20 years, hopefully longer than that, in the sense that we could very possibly will reach a point where we're serving God greater than we've ever served him before. I appreciate Brother Ed. Brother Ed is 89 years old. He's not retired. He's not sitting at home. Um, I don't know that he could actually stay awake to midnight to see the, the ball drop. But, <laughs> but the bottom line is, he's in church. And really, that's what all of us should be doing. And again, just because we've been called the mission field, don't think that there isn't something that each one of you is supposed to do. Because each of us has a will for our lives. Each of us has an opportunity for service. Each of us has those people that we're supposed to witness to. Because after all, we may be the only chance those people have if we don't witness to them. So if I choose to step away from what God has called me to do, that may be that person's only chance to receive the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why as we look toward the Apostle Paul, and we look to this as I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith, really isn't that what it comes down to? We really do have to keep the faith. And as hard as that is sometimes to do, and as discouraged as sometimes we, you can get, the bottom line is we have to keep the faith. And so that's, that's the closing thought that I would leave with you tonight, is that despite the ups and downs, despite the, despite the successes we sometimes have and even the failures that we sometimes have in service to God, it really isn't necessarily about those successes and failures, but it's more likely more about being consistent. Because when we wake up, because basically every day we wake up, we have a new opportunity to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in a better and better way than we've ever done before. God bless you. Thank you for your patience and understanding. Thank you, Brother Paul. Well, every one of these messages have had substance. Substance. Not just fluff, but substance, and I appreciate that. And uh, I'm glad there's some amening that I can do to every message. And we preachers amen each other, right? Amen. Yeah. <laughs> and so we got one more to go. Brother Aaron's going to preach for us. I, I am thrilled to have a small part in each one of your lives. And uh, these men that have preached tonight, uh, maybe I've had a little bit of influence here and yonder, and I certainly hope so. But it's a thrill to me to see each one of these men willing to preach and to uh, and try to lay out something of the help to that would be of help to all of us. And it's certainly a blessing and a privilege to have my own son working with me in the ministry, and to know that God has called him to preach. And it's a special thrill to see him preach for us tonight. Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. I heard about the man who uh, was caught shoplifting at the grocery store. And he stood before the judge a few days later to find out what his sentence was. And the judge asked him, he said, what did you steal from the grocery store? He said it was a can of peaches. And the judge said, well, how many peaches are, were in the can? He said, there were six. And so the judge said, well, your sentence will be six days in jail. As the man was turning to walk off, his wife, sitting uh, out there in the, in the crowd, piped up and said, Judge, he also st stole a can of peas. And so uh, I guess joy would be uh, what you, the difference between happiness and joy. You might not be happy there, but you still retain your joy, unless joy was his wife. Uh, Joshua chapter 1, verse number 5. Joshua 1, 5. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success.
have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Now there's a common desire within every person to be successful in life. Here we come into the new year, and I've kind of got some new year thoughts. Uh, and each new year we generally you know, wish for a healthy, happy, prosperous, and successful new year. Uh, but often we measure our success uh, according to the world standard rather, rather than to the Bible standard. And so uh, the world often measures our success by luxury, wealth, possessions, brains, brawn, knowledge, beauty, fame, all of those different things. But if we measure our success according to the world standards, we'll have an inaccurate and incomplete view of whether or not we're successful. You see, God's standard of measurement is nothing like the world's. And so I think we can find the key to success, what the Bible defines as success and happiness, in these verses here at Joshua. Now a little background on this part of the story. Joshua has just taken over the uh, nation of Israel. He's been called to lead this nation. You might say that's a little bit frightening for a man like Joshua to step into the shoes of Moses. And how would he be able to fill the shoes of a man like Moses? Uh, no doubt it would be somewhat terrifying to Joshua. Uh, Joshua is entering a new phase into his life. He's just been given the order by God to go into the, into the promised land and to drive all of those nations out. You have several different nations of people living there for 400 years while Israel was in bondage in, in Egypt. And so now Joshua's job is to lead these people into the land that God has promised them. And Joshua, no doubt, wanted to be a successful leader. And so I think we can draw some parallels between Joshua and ourselves as we enter the beginning of this brand new year. And uh, some of us will embark on new journeys to India and some into new ministries here at the church and into our own personal lives. We'll begin new stages. And as a church, as a whole, we'll move into a new phase of ministry and we'll see new people come into the ministry and begin to work in different areas of the ministry. And so for all of us, uh, whether it's got to do with our personal lives and jobs and and, uh, and entertainment and whatever the case is, we have some hope for success and prosper each year. So how do we find that? Well, number one, I think the first thing we see is that we're to stand on the promises of God. Uh, we sing the song, Standing on the Promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing on the promises. Uh, but sometimes we really don't mean what we're singing. As one preacher said, it's more like we're sitting on the premises rather than standing on the promises. And so look at what God told Joshua there at the beginning. He says, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. No doubt God knows, being God, that Joshua must have some, uh, some uh, semblance of fear to step into this job, to lead maybe two to three million people. And so God says, Joshua, don't be afraid. Be strong, be courageous. Just like I was with Moses, I'm going to be with you. I won't fail you, I won't forsake you. Now the Bible says that if you're a saved, born-again child of God, that living inside of us is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible tells us that we have a friend that sticks closer than a brother. God gives us the same promise that he gave Joshua. Stand on the promise. How do you have success in life? Stand on the promises that God gives you. He will be with you until you die. Uh, in fact, here in these verses, these four verses, God tells Joshua three times, be strong and courageous. I think it was important that Joshua understood that it was going to take strength and courage to perform the task and that God was going to be there with him every step of the way. I think it was important for Joshua to know that it was going to take this because Joshua was going to have a big battle to face, literal battles to face. And uh, an army to lead and people to lead. You ever feel like you're facing a battle in your life? Uphill battle? Uh, the odds might be against you. See, there's hundreds of times in our lives where we face circumstances like that, where in our humanized things seem impossible. The Bible tells us with God, all things are possible. Uh, there's outward circumstances like illnesses and disabilities, broken relationships, financial problems, the loss of a job, and the list goes on. Then there's inner conflicts that test our faith, attacks on our personal integrity, remaining faithful when no one's looking, enduring the sting of loneliness and separation, and standing alone when you're misunderstood. See, there's many times in our lives when we're going to need to hear the same command that God gave to Joshua, be strong 
and courageous. Not only do we need to apply this principle to our personal lives, but we need to apply it to our congregation as a church. See, it'd be very easy for us to, to look at this congregation with only our human eyes and our human understanding and say, you know, we're just we're too small. Look at what we have here tonight. We're just too small and insignificant to have much of an impact in Cersei. Let's just do what little we can with what we've got. You see, that kind of philosophy, I feel like, is a weak excuse for a weak faith. In God's success formula, the first thing we must do is be strong and courageous for the Lord. Your God is with you wherever you go. Stand on the promises of God. Number two, surrender to the precepts of God. Not only stand on the promises of God, but surrender to the precepts. Look down there where he says, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left. And then in verse 8 he goes on to say, this book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. God says, Joshua, you want to be successful in life? You want to be a successful leader? Not only do you need to stand on the promises that I've given you, but you need to obey what I've commanded you. He says, uh, uh, be strong and courageous, but adhere to all the law. You, you notice he said, all the law? Sometimes that's difficult for us to obey all that God says. He tells Joshua, he says, you can't pick and choose what part of it you want to obey, Joshua. And then he says, you can't turn from it to the right hand or to the left. He says, don't compromise, Joshua. I've got it laid out in, right here. The law's laid out for you. It's not your job to, to decide, I'm going to go this way or I'm going to go that way. I've already laid it out for you. Sometimes we read our Bibles and we see God says we ought to do this. But, you know, like Brother Paul said, my pride, whatever, I don't really want to do it that way. I understand that's what the Bible says, but I'm just going to choose to ignore that. I was watching... On uh, PBS last night, they had a, a documentary about Indian religion. And I heard uh, it was a, a professor from Indiana University was there on a pilgrimage. And he was discussing why Hinduism is a great religion. And he said, it's a very contemporary religion. And he said, it's really the best religion of our day because Hinduism, it's not, some people think it's, a, it's about worshiping multiple gods, but it's not. He said, they only worship one god. They just have different uh, idols and different, different ways to that god. And so it's a very contemporary religion because now it, you don't have to go to a building where they have a set time and a book that you have to read from. With Hinduism, you can find your own way to God. See, that's what it's about. We don't want to go by what God already told us in the book. He's already laid out for us. He says, do according to all that I've written. You can't make your own way. The Bible says there's one way to God. D.L. Moody once said, the Bible was not written for your information, but for your transformation. I tell the kids in children's church almost every Sunday, there's three things. If you're a Christian, a born-again child of God, there's three things as a Christian you ought to do. Number one, read your Bible every day. Uh, you may not be able to read an hour a day, but, but maybe read 10 minutes a day or read one chapter a day or read 10 verses. Just find some time to read your Bible every day. That's what God told Joshua. Joshua, uh, there in verse 8, meditate therein day and night. Read your Bible every day. If you want to be successful this coming year, read your Bible every day. And then, not just to read it, but it says meditate. Meditate takes it a step further than just reading. You read it and then think on what you've seen. I've read this. Now, what does that actually mean? What was God saying there? Let, let me make sure I soak that in and get it. And then once you've done that, then apply it. And sometimes, especially as adults, that's where we really have a disconnect is applying it. We read it, and I understand that's what it says, but eh, the Bible says, uh, if you're a Christian, that 10% of everything that you make belongs to God. Okay, I understand what God's saying. I owe a tithe to Him. Oh, but man. I can't afford to give that money to God. I need that 10%. And there's a disconnect, and, and we face that all the time. I tell the kids each Sunday, I said, if you learn this now at your age, and, and you read your Bible, you study it, and you obey what God says now, make it a habit now, then when you're 20, 30, 40, and 50 years old, it won't be a problem. Get it down today. Uh, every, everything a Christian should do, three things. Read your Bible every day, and then pray. Uh, if we're going to communicate with God, He's not going to talk out loud. He's not going to Instagram. He's not going to Facebook you. He's going to talk to you through His Word. That's God talking to us. Prayer is how we talk back to God. So as a Christian, read your Bible every day. Pray every day. And be faithful to church. This is where we come to get strengthened and encouraged. 
Joshua is told if he'll meditate, if he'll apply the principles, the precepts that he's found in the law. Now, we don't go by the same law that Joshua went by. We're in the New Testament, but we still apply the same principles to our lives today. Uh, so Joshua is told if you'll meditate day and night, and then observe to do. Make up your mind that you're going to do. Once you find out that you're doing something wrong, it's then your job to correct it, to do what you know is right. Then you'll have success. And thou shalt make thy way prosperous. God says you want to be successful, you want to have a prosperous life. It's pretty simple. God doesn't make things difficult for us. Read your Bible, meditate, pray, go to church, do what I've said, obey me. Man, that's not difficult. The kids understand it. The kids in junior church, man, they got it. Why do adults have such a problem understanding those things? He promises to bless us when we obey his word. We don't just speed read through it to check it off on a box that I got the, that I got the reading done. Meditate on it. Then put it into practice what you've learned. You see, sometimes you're going to get tired of the grind. It's not, diff- it's not easy to do it every day, day in and day out. It's going to take some work. You may feel like giving up and feel like giving in. And boy, this just isn't worth it. But God says, be faithful. God blesses faithfulness. God blesses obedience. If you'll do what God says. You look at Joshua. uh, He goes to the people. He had a big task. They said, Joshua, we can't do what you're wanting us to do. We look like grasshoppers in the eyes of those people. And our hearts melt with fear. But Joshua said, you know what? God said, I'm with you. And so they said, well, if God's with us, then let's do it. And they went in, and they were successful. They lived a victorious Christian life. And that's what Joshua, the book of Joshua, is about, living a victorious Christian life. You want a victorious year, a successful year, a prosperous year. It's defined different than the world standards. It may not come in the form of of luxury and cars and wealth and money and fame and fortune. But in God's eyes, you can be successful if you do these things found in the first few verses of Joshua. All good messages, every one. I think God, I think God would be pleased with what's been preached tonight, and I think He'd be pleased if we have a piano player to come and play a verse or two of invitation, and uh, give you the opportunity. Maybe there's something you want to pray about tonight. It's New Year's Eve, and uh, I know people set goals and and sometimes some uh, <clears throat> resolutions and stuff. I think commitment is a good word. Commitments to God. Let me ask you these questions. Uh, did you get something from each of these messages? I think, uh, I think it would be easy to, to say, I got something out of how do you hear? How do you hear? Did you hear something tonight? Uh, are you following images, false images, or is your Christianity real and concrete? Is it based on the Lord and his word? What about, uh, what about finishing strong? Are you concerned about finishing stronger? Each each one of us this coming year ought to be a stronger Christian than we were last year. And uh, we ought to finish not only this year strong, we ought to finish next year and finish our life strong. Uh, What about your joy? Is your Christianity a joy or is it a drudgery? It can be corrected if it's a drudgery. And how successful is your life? Is it real success would God be pleased I think he's been pleased with us being here tonight let's bow our heads and uh, and have a word of prayer and then we're going to ask the piano to play Father I pray that you'd bless thank you for the messages that have been preached preached tonight uh, dear Lord there's been substance in every one of them and I pray that you'd uh, nail it in our hearts securely and may it carry over into the new year and for the rest of our life bless us tonight as we consider the things we ought to commit to you for this coming year In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed and the piano's playing. If you need to come and pray and ask God to give you strength to make some decision or to do something in this coming year, why don't you just come? And uh, and I always want to say this after every service. I always want, in case there's somebody in the room or somebody's watching on the internet or listening to an audio sermon, it might be that they're, saying, you know, none of that really made a lot of sense to me. Well, the Bible says that spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And so if you've never been born again, you wouldn't make a lot of connection there because most of this preaching has been about the Christian life. And if you're not a Christian, 
none of it would make a lot of sense, nor would it be very appealing. But when you realize that God wanted to save you from a devil's hell and he sent Jesus to the cross to pay for your sins for you, and when you realize that he will love you and save you and change your life if you'll be saved, then you're motivated to know more about him. If you're not saved, I challenge you tonight, ask Jesus Christ to save you based on his shed blood on the cross of Calvary. The gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Would you trust him tonight?